Hello. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the development of Christianity in the Middle Ages. And we're going to be looking at aspects of Christianity outside of the Latin-speaking traditions. First looking at Christianity as it's located in Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire. And then how the Church of the East comes into contact with Chinese cultures. So we're talking about Byzantine Christianity or East Roman Christianity to start. And just notice the two different terms are Byzantine or East Roman. Byzantium was the name of Constantinople used by those in uh, Latin speaking contexts. But the members of this empire thought themselves as a continuation of the Roman Empire. And so some scholars today now refer to them as East Romans or the East Roman Empire or East Roman Christianity. One of the significant factors here is the encounter of this branch of Christianity with Islam. And so I have a map up for you on Populi that shows how the Byzantine Empire or the East Roman Empire um, exists in relationship to the spread of Islam across the Middle East, North Africa, and indeed the whole Mediterranean basin. A, key, a couple of key uh, points here is simply to note a history of the expansion of Islam as it comes into contact with various forms of Christianity. Uh, we have Muhammad, who receives a series of revelations between the years 610 and 632 from the one God, or Allah, in Mecca. These are written down after his death. He dies in the year 632. Around the year 660, these revelations are composed into what we now know as the Quran. In the year 622, Muhammad and his followers are forced to leave Mecca and go to Medina. Twelve years later, in the year 630, they return and capture Mecca and purge idols from the Kaaba, which is a large um, black structure. Uh, which is believed to have been the site, according to the Islamic traditions, where Abraham had worshipped Allah or God. Again, note here that the word Allah does not refer to a different God than the God of Abraham or the God of Moses or the God of Jesus. This is something like the Arabic word for God, similar to the Hebrew word El or Elohim. Muhammad dies in the year 632. After this, his followers form a federation, which begins a systematic expansion of territory in which the members of these uh, new territories often accept Islam or find ways to uh, live as religious minorities within it, especially Jews and Christians are given protected status as people of the book. By the year 650, all the Eastern Mediterranean and the Persian Empire has fallen under the um, control of Arab Muslims. In the year 711 is the Arab invasion of Christian Spain, which leads to Islam being the dominant religion of the, of the Iberian Peninsula for hundreds of years. Islam, Islamic armies continue to try to spread into Europe through across the Pyrenees into France. In the year 732, Charles Martel, the grandfather of Charlemagne, defeats the spread uh, at the Battle of Poitiers. So we have parts of Western Europe, North Africa, and the Eastern Mediterranean all under Islamic control. Now for Christians, there was a lot of crisis about what the rise of Islam meant. Some saw this as a temporary punishment from God for Christian sin. Others thought that um, this was a sign that the Antichrist had arrived and the end days were upon them. And so others found that Islam was essentially a form of Christian uh, heresy, similar to monophysitism, um, insofar as they interpreted the Islamic views of Jesus Christ as heretical. It turns out that in general, non-Chalcedonian Christians were less anxious than Chalcedonian Christians over this conquest. Um, 
this might be because of the ways in which uh, these groups were experiencing persecution from Constantinople, the seat of Chalcedonian Christianity. But uh, over a period of three centuries, most of the inhabitants of the Eastern Mediterranean and the former Persian Empire have converted to Islam. So this gives you a sense of some of the foundational points for how Eastern Roman Christianity is developing its identity. This encounter with Islam is a significant aspect of the development of Christianity in the Middle Ages. And it informs the other significant elements of uh, theology of this time period, which is this controversy over icons, or the iconoclast controversy. The word iconoclast means literally to smash or break images. And the question here is, are images appropriate for Christian worship? There is a series of controversies through the late 8th and early 9th century around this. So in the year 754, a council convenes, which does condemn icons in Christian worship as violating uh, the first or second commandment, depending on how you date, uh, number those. In the year 787, there's the second ecumenical council of Nicaea, which in turn approves the use of icons in worship. And the year 815, the Emperor Leo V turns around and condemns icons again. And in the year 843, the Empress Theodora goes and approves icons. So we have this really uh, almost uh, 75 years of turmoil over what the status of icons are in Eastern Christian uh, or East Roman Christianity. And there's a couple of issues at play in the use of icons. One is theological. Uh, Byzantine Christians are wondering, are icons idols? And was our use of icons in worship part of why God punished us Christians with the Arabic conquest of uh, and with these people associated with the Islamic religion? One of the key factors here is that Islam itself is strongly an iconic. That is, it rejects any attempt to picture divinity or even to engage in representational art for fear that it might inspire some kind of idolatry. So the connection between the rise of Islam and iconoclasm is really strong. There's some economic issues here. Uh, one of the first emperors to condemn icons in 754 is Constantine V, and he is using icon, he's using his opposition to icons for uh, an attempt to raise funds to uh, conquer lands seized by Arab armies. So he uses iconoclasm to shutter monasteries uh, because the monasteries were a significant, significant site for support of the use of icons. So um, seize the monasteries, confiscate their property, liquidate their property in order to raise up armies. And then there is this whole dynamic in which icons are, uh, because they're supported within the monastic system, monasteries exist as an independent entity that really the emperor has no way of really having kind of oversight of. And so there's some political rivalry between monastic networks and imperial networks also. At the end of the day, um, what occurs is the monks who support icons, they're not known, they're known as iconoduels or icon um, venerators, are seen as heroic defenders of icons. But many monasteries really lose a lot of their status and size as a result and then fall more firmly under the supervision of administrative structures in the life of the church. So there's a whole political dynamic going on here that uh, we should be aware of and just recognize this is part of how history works. What I want to focus the rest of our time on, though, is thinking about a theology of icons. Why can icons be used? And here I want us to focus our attention on John of Damascus and uh, his 
text on divine images, which emerges as a defense of the use of icons. Now, John Damascus is a very interesting figure. I have an icon of him up on the course site. He's from an Arab Greek Christian family. You note know in his iconography, he's wearing a turban style headdress indicating this ethnic heritage. He is actually an administrator within the caliphate um, it is controlling the region of Damascus where he lives. He is venerated as the so-called last of the fathers, the last link in the patristic tradition, and is thought of as a great systematizer of orthodox doctrine. And he also attempts to catalog all the various heresies, and he counts Islam as really the final heresy, although today we would see it as a distinct religious tradition. What is significant about John of Damascus is the way in which he uses the doctrine of the incarnation to show how the veneration of icons is permissible. So what I'm trying to show you here is how all that Christology that you've been learning has a tangible effect in Christian practice. And his argument is that the hypostatic union of the divine and human natures means a transformation of material reality. So insofar as the human body can show forth the divine reality, which is what happens in the incarnation, so too physical matter like wood and paint is capable of showing forth something about God also. So with this, I want you to turn to page 290 of Cochlear and Sterk. And we're going to read on the Divine Images, section 4, which breaks this down. Now, I am on the right-hand side about uh, a third of the way down. He writes, I do not adore the creation rather than the creator. He's talking about icons being the creation. But I adore the one who became a creature. That's Jesus Christ who was formed as I was, who clothed himself in creation without weakening or departing from his divinity, that he might rise our nature and raise our nature in glory and make us partakers of his divine nature. So here he's just summarizing the whole orthodox doctrine of the incarnation, which is that Jesus Christ is fully human and fully divine and incarnate for us so that we might participate in the divine life. Okay, then going on, he says, Together with my king, my God and father, I worshipped him, that is the son, who clothed himself in the royal purple of my flesh, not as a garment that passes away, or as if the Lord incarnate constituted a fourth person of the Trinity, God forbid. The flesh assumed by him is made divine and endures after its assumption. Fleshly nature was not lost when it became part of the Godhead. But just as the word made flesh remain the word, so also flesh became the word, yet remained flesh, being united to the person of the word. So again, he's narrating an essential foundational understanding of what the incarnation is. And then he writes, Therefore, I boldly draw an image of the invisible God, not as invisible, but as having become visible for our sakes by partaking of flesh and blood. So, why do we have icons of Jesus Christ? And why can we venerate them? Because, while we cannot say we've ever fully seen God as God is in God's self, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and standing outside of time and creation, because of the Incarnation, we can say we do know what God looks like incarnated in Jesus Christ. In other words, when we look at an icon of Jesus Christ, we are seeing God. Because his image has been passed down to us through a tradition of iconographers. This is John's argument. When we look at an image of Jesus Christ, we are seeing God and wood, color, metal, pigment is all capable of expressing this. Now this might be a little mind blowing. So let's think this through a little bit more is then 
how do we know this? And he pulls from the New Testament witness. And let's turn to chapter 8 of On Divine Images. This is on page 291 of Copeland Stirk. And again, I'm on the right-hand side, about five lines down. So God says in Exodus, Exodus 33, you cannot see my form. How, and so John uh, asks, how can the invisible be depicted? How does one picture the inconceivable? So it's obvious, skipping a few lines down, that when you contemplate God becoming man or human, then you may depict him clothed in human form. When the invisible one becomes visible to flesh, you may then draw his likeness. And then he goes through all of these different events of the life of Jesus that you can depict him in, right? So you could talk about his birth, his baptism, his transfiguration, his suffering on the cross, his miracles, his resurrection. You can depict Jesus Christ and icons in all his ways, because in these specific moments, the human nature is showing forth divine nature by these actions. So these are uh, moments in the life of Jesus that are especially worthy of representation. Okay, fair enough. But what about other ways of thinking about icons, especially the icons of saints. Why can we show icons of saints? And here there's an argument on chapter 19, this starts on page 294, about, okay, it's fine to show the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos, but don't show any more saints. On the very bottom of that page of 294, John responds. He says, but St. John the theologian, that's uh, the uh, Apostle John, the writer of the gospel, who leaned on the breast of Christ says, quoting the first letter of John, we shall become like him. Just as something in contact with fire becomes fire, not by its own nature, but by being united, burned, and mingled with fire, so it is also, I say, with the assumed flesh of the Son of God. By union with his person, that flesh participates in divine nature, and by this communion becomes unchangeably God, not only in the operations of divine grace, as was the case of the prophets, but by the coming of grace himself. Skipping down a few lines from the very end of that paragraph. The saints during their earthly lives were filled with the Holy Spirit, and when they fulfill their course, the grace of the Holy Spirit does not depart from their souls or their bodies in the tombs or from their likenesses and holy images, not by the nature of these things, but by grace and power. If the incarnation is so that we may participate in the divine life, saints and God are particularly representative of what it looks like to participate in the divine life. And that participation is, is empowered by the action of the Holy Spirit, who is God also. And so saints become infused with divinity by grace, not by nature. They're not by nature divine, but they've been infused by grace with something of a likeness of Christ. And so we too can venerate them and that power does not leave at death because Christ has conquered death. So death is no longer a barrier. So we can venerate their relics, for instance. And also, the created matter itself is no longer a barrier to encountering the holy. So we can also encounter the saint in the image of the saint, just as we can encounter Christ in the image of Christ. In a way, what orthodoxy is providing here is their breaking down of the dualism between spirit and matter and uniting the two. So what, what I want to offer to you here is a way of thinking about how the incarnation itself is a way of reconciling opposites and to think about these orthodox teachings then leading to practices 
like the veneration of icons that are designed to have one develop in the spiritual life so that as the evangelist John says, we may become like him. That's all I have for now. Let's reflect on this some more when we are in class. I look forward to our time together.